at my professorship, we bring together different scientific methods. And this includes mathematical study, computational simulations, but also experiments. Now there is a fourth pillar of scientific investigation recently, which is data science. So we're looking into large amounts of data in order to understand better how diseases spread, how innovation spreads, how ideas or culture spread. And obviously, big data is now becoming a new paradigm of evidence-based decision-making. It's creating entirely new possibilities to optimize processes, services, and products. Uh, we can build smarter cities. We can reduce energy consumption. We can save our environment better. We can actually um, use scarce resources much better. Because data inform us how we can use all these potentials in a much more efficient way. Well, there are a number of things that actually contribute to this. Uh, we're kind of behind in the regulation of the di digital sector. So we don't have good regulations in place to ensure our informational self-determination and also there are not good sanctioning schemes. So as a result, what we see is that whatever we do on the web and even in real life is kind of leaving digital breadcrumbs which are collected by companies that we often even don't know by name. And as a result, we've lost control over our personal information and we don't know who is doing what with our data. This needs to be changed and that can be changed with technologies that are now becoming available, such as uh, personal data stores. Uh, the MIT, for example, has been working on open PDS, but there are also companies that are offering now solutions for this that would give the citizen control over personal data. So we could decide whom to share what kind of data with if we want to share these data at all and we, we would get a fair payment for these kind of data so this is what we need to engage in because that's a basic pillar of democracy well there are certainly different ways i, I think we need to combine a bundle of different activities we need to change our way we are using the internet. Uh, we need to change the social norms of uh, how we're um, operating in the internet. We need to have certain laws and regulations. We need to have efficient sanctioning schemes. But altogether, I think um, politics and, and business need to invest into the data infrastructure for the future and uh, we need to prepare for the digital age to come. In fact, we are now facing something like a digital revolution. We will lose a lot of jobs in the industrial sector and the service sector because computers become ever more smarter. They can do many routines that people have done in the past. And so we need to create many new jobs in a creative and uh, data related business. One of the things that we certainly need to reflect on is the coming age of the Internet of Things. So we will have a lot of sensors distributed in our environment. People expect then that in about 10 years time, we'll have about 150 billion sensors. That means, you know, 10, 20 sensors or even more for every one of us. So we couldn't do a single step or speak a single word without this being recorded. Now, just assume that would be in the hands of a single company. It could be a dystopic surveillance nightmare. If, uh, we want to keep our democracy, and I think this is going to be also a, a very important governance principle in the future, then we need to make sure that we operate and build 
the Internet of Things in a way that's consistent with democracy. And so my recommendation is to build the Internet of Things as a citizen web. I mean, bottom up. So the citizens themselves would build it and would manage the system. It would be an open data source for everyone, creating benefits for politics, for business, uh, for science and for the citizens in the first place. And I imagine it to be something like a, a real-time open data Wikipedia, you could say, you know. I get much more support for the ideas I'm promoting than criticisms or questions, I, I should say. For many people, it's quite plausible. They believe this is a very interesting way to go. Some people, of course, think, okay, would a bottom-up, a more bottom-up, I mean, you know, the, the framework wouldn't change, but a more bottom-up involvement, would that really work? Would we have uh, more social order? Would we have um, uh, more economic well-being? You know, how, how would it work? And for this, it requires some knowledge of complex systems and an understanding on how self-organization works. You know, it's uh, something that um, appears to be pretty magic for some people, and so it, it's difficult to believe. But uh, based on the experience I've collected in 30 years' time, I, I can really say now this is a very powerful principle uh, to use. And in many cases, the classical top-down approaches are not working well enough anymore. So we need something better. And that means to combine top down with bottom up in a new way, in a more powerful way. And I think this can be actually done. The other thing is that we need to recognize that uh, the digital revolution will bring about a number of fundamental changes of how our society and economy work. And this is for a number of reasons. First of all, information is a non-material resource. So it can be multiplied as often as we like. Uh, we don't have to have war about you know, sharing information, depending, of course, on the legal framework. Uh, while uh, material resources have always been short. So this very fact that information is immaterial has really very important implications, uh, but there are many other implications. Now, I believe ideas will be more important in the future because information uh, will be a dominating force. Um, you'll also see a different way of organizing production. Just think of 3D printers. So suddenly we can produce things at home. Suddenly people talk about a sharing economy. And that's probably in part a response to the financial and economic crisis that we have. Um, interestingly enough, uh, this is not only enabling people to keep a high standard of life and a high quality of life, with less resources, but it's also increasing uh, the sustainability of our systems because we need uh, to use less materials to reach this quality of life. And so there are a number of interesting things going on and we need to understand what the implications of this digital revolution are so we can use the forces for us rather than be surprised by these forces. You know, I think it's not wise to fight against them, but we need to learn how to turn them into our advantages in the very same way as we have learned how to use the natural forces to our advantages.